So good morning, World of Commodore. Welcome to 8-Bit Symphony Talk. Uh, this is Chris Abbott. Hello. Chris, uh, as probably well known to many of you, he helped establish the Sid remix scene in the 90s. Uh, and more recently, he's been working with well-known Commodore composers uh, to bring our beloved childhood tunes to the symphony. I'm David Yowd. I'm eight time zones away in California. I've had the privilege of doing behind the scenes stuff with Abbott over the years. Mostly I just stay out of the way and watch him pull off the seemingly impossible. Uh, this is Yuri. Can you wave? So Yuri is our other interviewer. Uh, this good friend of mine also from California. Yuri has mad Commodore skills, but I don't want to say what those are because he'll start getting emails from all of you if I do. Uh, but it's safe to say that uh, he's an inquisitive person and he has the advantage here of being largely uninitiated uh, in the ways of symphonic Commodore music. So he'll be asking many of the questions of Chris that you're likely wondering about uh, as well. This talk is pre-recorded, uh, but there will be a live Discord-based Q&A uh, that follows. So good morning for us, not for you, Chris. Uh, thanks and all for- And the evening. And it is good he's as, as asking the questions because you know far too much. Oh yeah, I'm just going to try to duck out of this as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Chris, can you kick things off with maybe a quick overview of what are you doing right now and how did you start on this journey? Um, the journey to making Commodore 64 music into bigger than Commodore 64 music in the remixing came from my mum. Um, because I had to prove to her that the noises I was listening to on the TV weren't actually ear-ripping articles of horribleness, but were actually decent uh, compositions which were um, which were meaningful and, and full. Um, you have to get that... Well, when you're a teenager, it's easy to get that from the original material, because the original material is suggestive as opposed to complete. Um, it, the original material is is just three voices. And with that, it has to hint at violins, it has to hint at guitars, it has to hint at basses, it has to hint at flutes. And sometimes it hints at notes and musical content which simply isn't there. Um, in fact, sometimes it does that so well that two people could listen, could have entirely different mental pictures of the, of the pieces. Some of the pieces that were done back then were... It, it, seemed to be naturally orchestral. They seemed to be trying to be orchestral. They seemed to be trying to burst out of the chip, um, such as Kentilla. Um, and even some of the early American things that uh, Paul Norman did, Forbidden Forest, Aztec Challenge, Super Huey, they were all quite obviously trying to be a big 80s film score. And it was obvious from the... It's very clever how, how he did it, because he he had literally three sawtooth waves and yet somehow he managed to convey all of that um, by choice of composition uh, structure we're usually very short though so there were more jingles almost <laughs> but um, lots of them so there was a lot to work with and um now, that was quite a privilege meeting him at your uh, whole performance which you'll probably describe here soon um just it i was able to talk with paul and just say it, it's just as adults, many of us are trying to figure out how the ancient ones did these things, but in a really short amount of time in the 80s, you know, he just took on the task, taught himself assembly language, learned Commodore internals, played on his guitar and entered them as hex codes and made these wonderful tunes. And um, I was just, it, it's very impressive. And uh, he, 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 was a, he was a rock musician and also writing things like progressive rock musicals <laughs> before he ever touched a computer and the the one the one key thing about all of the composers pretty much that we featured in a bit symphony is that the composer themselves had a musical background beyond other computer music or 80 synth rob hubbard had a background in jazz and classical music theory and rock and roll they, they spent he, he spent a decade pretty much gigging around uh, it, doing tribute bands um, where they had to play everything. It was, it was the typical um, turn up to a pub, play on stage, hope no one threw a glass at you. It's like um, in the Blues Brothers. Country and Western. <laughs> in this case, it was a uh, rock and or pop. 
And um, uh, Martin Galway had uh, musical talent in the family and so a background of, of syncopation and uh, because his uncle was James Galway, the famous flautist. Oh, yeah. And um, Paul had his background. Um, an exception was Mark Cooksey, who did Ghosts and Goblins and Storm Warrior. Who, he came to, he started off as a programmer and found he could compose a little bit. Um, I think he, he was more of a musical sponge because once he started programming music, he started absorbing lots and lots of influences from, uh, say, Klaus and Wunderlich and Bach and uh, all a mishmash of, uh, uh, of influences which went into what he eventually did. Um, what he does now is he does music for um, slot machines. Oh, yeah. uh, Actually, a lot they, of the they, they, people have gone into the slot machine uh, realm, yeah. And uh, they, they ask him, oh, can you do something which sounds like Rage of the Lost Ark? And, he, uh, and he's got these BP sets saying, okay. <laughs> and um, as, as I drink out of this mug, uh, which is from one of your Kickstarters, uh, even I, who have been following what you've been doing, um, sort of get lost in the sheer amount of activity that you produce. You've had lots of Kickstarters. Can you tell a little bit about help people to differentiate between these individual efforts and how it's different from what you're doing now? Um, if you squint, it tells a story. Um, in 2015, and in, in, I'd, I'd, in 2015, I'd already been remixing for 20 years and uh, producing various um, different types of so, different types of stuff. Uh, in my third album, I did a concept album of Commodore 64 remixes, which was essentially part Jean-Michel Jarre and part John Williams and part New Age. And what happened is those three parts of that album all splintered into three separate projects. One was a New Age album I did when my children were born back in 2003, which was uh, to send them to sleep, basically. <laughs> Um, one of them went to Marcel Donnet, uh, who did Project Sidology, which is Jean-Michel Jean Vangelis meets Commodore 64. And that, 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 that ended up on an insane seven CDs and a DVD on the end, which had the surround sound mixes, which themselves took a year to mix because they were manually hand done. It's the best use of surround sound you will ever hear. It's, you know, when you, you're looking at the, in, the, in the shop and you listen to the, the demo, and then you listen to films and you've got a few sound effects here and there. But other than that, it's not particularly noticeable because they don't want you to notice the surround sound because that's not part of the, uh, that would distract. But with this, it was all the way around uh, sensible artistic decisions. And the John Williams stuff went into, uh, was put on, kind of put on hold until the technology and the opportunities came up to actually kickstart doing some scores. And, and then, so there was a kickstarter was where my, I, I, my pitch to everyone was, okay, if you give, give me the money, we'll do the scores. I'll do computer renders of them as best I can, because um, uh, it raised like 36,000 in, in orchestral terms that buys you nothing. And in, uh, I, I didn't know what I was letting myself in for because it was like three albums of Commodore 64 music, not just a single album, but three of them eventually ending up as like 40 tracks, which took five years um, to, to completely finish um, um, with lots of detours along the way. And that's where, that's where it started. It started because we couldn't sell sheet music because not enough people will buy it. So you can't raise the money you need to start doing the sheet music. <laughs> so we had to sell renders and then go from there. Luckily those renders were good enough to be able to persuade Hull Philharmonic Orchestra to actually devote one of their guys to help bring the scores into a proper um, formatting and uh, sanity checking and whatever. And then the kind of the team kind of congealed around the concert, so that all the stuff uh, it's a, a case of cometh the hour, cometh the men, really. Um, so the 
but the, the, the surround sound that we did on Avis Symphony was taken from Project Sidology. A lot of the team was taken from the live events. Then um, uh, Rob Hubbard was got involved when I did a Kickstarter concentrating on his stuff to get him back into doing new SIDS and doing remixing and taking a lot of his archive stuff because that was called Project Hubbard. And that re-engaged him with the scene after he'd been semi-retired. And that gave us the opportunity to finally give him what he wanted, which was 80 piece orchestras and to indulge his, because um, he'd been doing these orchestrations over the years. He'd, he'd had something performed in Leipzig in 2005 which is international karate. And he loved that experience. And the reason international, uh, uh, an international karate, which I think was, what was it called in in the US? Uh, karate, it wasn't karate champ, was it? it was, There's a number of people shouting the answer at the screen right yes, now. Yes, <laughs> I grew up with international karate. <laughs> anyway, so um, the, the reason the, the international karate is not a very um, orchestral piece as it stands um, but Rob used that as a jumping off point to exercise as many different styles as he could in this thing because he said I might not get another chance to do this eventually they truncated some of it <laughs> but uh, when it was scored he was like okay and and you can hear that because it's it's like about five kung fu movies at once um, and then it all went quiet. There were some odd orchestral performances that were done by video games live or score or play, but only like small medleys. And um, quite often, um, uh, Rob didn't like what they'd done with them. It was like they were, they were usually done um, against the time limit and against the budget. And he didn't, uh, and sometimes it was just that he didn't think they'd put enough effort in. So, you know, they, they'd done what they needed to do to get a performance on stage, but sometimes only the, you need an, you need an amateur or the actual person who wrote it originally to, to say, okay, this is what I'll, I'll do with this. And Rob feel, he doesn't feel necessarily very constrained by his original material. So he will take it into areas where I would not dare if it was with my arrangements, my arrangements tentatively go new places and then hope that they don't upset anymore. When he does it, it's canonical. Uh, absolutely. I mean, th this is the thing We're, with Monty on the run. There's a, there's a thing at the beginning. Uh, there's a, there's a segment at the beginning on the Sid and he listened to that and he said, that's wrong. I said, how can it be wrong? It's, like, it's the official release version. No, no, that's a, that's a, that's a typo. <laughs> and he changed it in the arrangement. So the arrangement is more canonical than the actual canon. I think that happened with the uh, Archon theme as well when they discovered the, uh, the original music, sheet music for it. There was a discrepancy, but if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, and um, so, that, so he felt, um, and there was a, in, a bit in a, quite a lot of Monty on the run is not orchestratable at all unless you're doing it very i mean i did it because i do that sort of thing but it wasn't very interesting for an orchestra sure. so Rob, it, because it was based on a guitar solo and drum solos and that's just it's a repeated four chord riff and improvising over the top and that's not very orchestral at all i i, I got over that by doing it with a saxophone riff but the orchestra is going to get very bored and Rob said, okay, jump that out and, um, and slip in a kind of return of the Jedi, uh, John Williams extended motif developing the themes that's informally known as Monty on the Spliff, um, which is Monty on, I don't know, what do they call it? Weed. Weed. Monty on the Weed, yeah. And so it's like a dream sequence. And um, that's... Uh, uh, if 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 you were if you were imagining that in your head, that bit would be Monty on the run in in various Monty Mole in various situations, like being a, an Ewok in Return of the Jedi and looking around confusedly, or um, suddenly popping up in other films and you know just before impending doom and then running away again. Um, the the a, a lot of the process of, of of doing the orchestration is actually coming up with the visuals or the 
the the idea to hang this, everything on. Otherwise, what you've just done is you've created, taken one set of notes and made them sound slightly different with different instruments. Um, so sometimes yep. you have to stylize it or you have to say, okay, I'm going to make this emotional statement and then follow it through. So, so for, for, can, I, can I take you on a rewind? Can I take you on a rewind from a little bit? Because we're now with an orchestra. So you started off, you've had this Commodore 64. With, your mom probably has been like, like my parents would have been screaming and yelling, what is this horrible sound coming out of the telly? Yep. And you call that music and you're trying to prove a point here. You were a young lad by that time. How, how did you even go about on just getting into remix and getting into, because we, we had no internet. It's not like you, you just pick up the internet, get the tools and here you are, you can start remixing something. Um, well, I started programming the Commodore 64 when a sequencer came out for it uh, in 1987. Uh -huh. So I was already programming covers of things on the Commodore 64. Um, and there, there was a tape called uh, Data Hits, which was released in 1980, uh, 1986, I think, which had, they, they, they'd taken the Commodore 64 recording into the studio and they'd added some drums yeah. and added some other instruments, not very many, and it wasn't done that well, if we're being honest. Mm -hmm. But it, it was kind of, it was mind blowing. And then Rob Hubbard himself did a synthesized version of Sanction, one yeah, of his most remember that, yeah. Um, and that appeared on the cover tape on the most popular Commodore 64 magazine, Here's Up 64. That, yeah, yeah, and, and that also blew everyone's minds. And at that point, that kind of put remixes on the map. That made, a, that made studio CD versions of the Commodore 64 tunes a goal. Um, and um, after my parents bought me a synthesizer, um, I did sort of as much as I could with the equipment I had, which wasn't very much an, an Atari 800 XL, a MIDI interface and a, a, a four voice synthesizer and a four track. Um, and I did some stuff, but none of it. Uh, uh, I, I did. I did get to program for a soft, some music for a software house, and only one tune ever got released, which was in a boxing game on the BBC Master Compact. Okay. Um, but it was enough to put on my CV. Oh. But then you have to fast forward into 1993 when Creative Labs released the AWE32 sound card, mm -hmm. and suddenly wavetable sound uh, in a MIDI, a general MIDI tune, became powerful enough to be able to remember the, the tunes and put them in and add add stuff like add some chords or add add some drums or add a harmony and yeah, then i moment in time already thinking about one day i'm gonna have a complete orchestra play some of this did you already have a dream or a vision of that at that moment in time because this is like i'm, I'm trying to plot a plot a line from someone that you know, gets a common by, by his mum to get into this big thing of this fantastic orchestra piece that we have been able to enjoy in part one. Well, in, in the 1985 review of Thing on the Spring in Zap 64, there was a, they reviewed the sound and they said, perhaps the London Symphony Orchestra could do better. And that's the seed where it all came from. Um, at that point, orchestra was kind of like the Holy Grail. So we get to 1990, we get to 1997, I released the first studio CD. I've already looked up Rob Hubbard on the internet by emailing all the Rob Hubbards on the internet, which was possible then. <laughs> it was actually CompuServe, so, um, uh, and he, he wrote back sufficiently puzzled. And after a brief detour through Filipino music and a very fat Elvis impersonator, uh, we get to where I, we produced Back in Time, which was the first studio CD with Commodore 64 remixes. They were synthesized. Um, Rob has contributed some extra parts for Delta and Monty on the Run and uh, Crazy Comets. So there was that. And then for the second one, I was in, I was in contact with a chap called Peter Connolly, uh, who worked for Core Design and did the music for Tomb Raider 4, 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I asked him uh, if he could do orchestral versions of Forbidden Forest and 
Aztec challenge because it had always bothered me that those were so obviously orchestral in my head and in his head too. And um, he seemed to be in a position to be able to do something about it because he was already doing orchestral music for Tomb Raider. Wow. And so he did. And the second, uh, so the second CD had orchestral, had Forbidden Forest and Aztec Challenge. The third CD, I decided that I'd join in. And at that point, Ben Daglish came in as well. And his, his piece, Trap, had always been meant as orchestral. And he was, he was like, hey, I want Trap to be, I want to be able to conduct it. And at that point, it was coming into focus which tunes were becoming, which tunes were naturally orchestral. And at that point, also, Rob Hubbard had taken to doing orchestral versions of his own tunes, such as uh, Kentilla, which was the first one I ever heard. And so the whole thing kind of just congealed until it resulted in a CD which had around about a third of orchestrated um, remixes. And, and then you made point, that a reality in Prague. Yeah, and uh, uh, in, in the year 2000, I was already talking to the Royal Festival Orchestra and trying to price up how much a concert would cost. Um, although it's lucky that that didn't go ahead because the music prep alone would have kept... Rob Hubbard would have had to do it by himself or you'd have had to pay tens of thousands of pounds and that, that was never going to fly. So in the absence of being able to do a classical concert, we went to doing... Uh, back in time live which was yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a, essentially a dj set in a big club eventually becoming live performances from various commodore 64 rock bands which was terribly difficult to explain because you've got a commodore 64 concert with no commodore 64s in it yeah yeah that was always difficult conceptually to, to people had a great time when they came but to get them to come you've got to persuade them what it's going to be like and it's impossible to explain right how do you see the generation that is up here now, which has such easy access again to how we grew up? How we, it's interesting. And we grew up either with the, with the ZX Spectrum, the Commodore 64 in the US, the uh, people had an Apple. Um, us in Europe, we would have likely have had a BBC or ex access to a BBC, my Model B or one of the others. It was a very creative time because you had to basically make a lot of this stuff on your own, we had fantastic documentation. And then we've had a long period of time that we had nothing. And right now we've got a new generation that's got their Arduinos, their raspberries and all of that, which is kind of bringing back some of that, you know, creativity, if you will. Do you see that audience, that newer generation connecting to having a love for this space as well? Well, my, my daughter loves this space and she's 18 now. Um, she's been growing up with Thing on a Spring and Commodore 64 right. music. Um, <laughs> her, her, but, but, but she never really used the Commodore 64. Her, her path to creativity was um, uh, programming stuff in Little Big Planet, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, doing stuff in Minecraft. Yeah. And uh, then she started to learn Python and started hacking RenP programs, hacking uh, role playing games to change the narrative structures. And now she wants to become a video game developer. Right. Um, uh, along the way, developing illustration skills, which she's been using for 8-Bit Symphony. So she's actually, she actually contributed the illustrations for the, that go on the screen during the concert uh -huh. and in the booklet. Very cool. Um, I think Gen Z is very creative. Um, I don't think they feel necessarily the uh, temptation to go back to the old platforms. Um, because they've, there's plenty to do on the new ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, part of that is because of people like you making this so accessible. I mean, there was, as I'm, I muse on this from time to time, the human race, you know, unless we bomb ourselves back to the Stone Age, right? We were analog and then we were digital. And there's this very thin early 80s time period in which we made that change over. And that's where the 8-bit wildness and creativity all was. 
and lots of people like me try to preserve a lot of that stuff. Um, and it's, it is well preserved because there's lots of geeks out there doing that. But you also take that and it, through lots of those remixes and especially your symphonic uh, conversions of these things, making it very accessible to the non-initiated. Because as you said, my parents would hear bleep bleep. And when they hear the symphony, they kind of understand what's, what's going on. Um, I do have a clip of one of your upcoming um, Dragon's Lair uh, examples from Dragon's Lair 2, that is the Sid versus the orchestral back to back for people that may not have heard some of your orchestrations before. So, uh, Rob Hubbard's in this case. Uh, oh, Rob the Symphonies and Orchestrations, the, the organization. Oh, this, the, sorry, the organization, the greater umbrella. Um, yeah, I so, can't take Rob's credit away. No, I, I'm not trying to do that. Uh, let me pull the trigger on that real quick, just to give people an idea of what's going on. Uh, except I have to figure out how to share stuff. Share screen. Um, okay, this is a back-to-back -back comparison. <laughs> Twenty twenty, Rob. That is an amazing conversion right there. Yeah, it's just awesome. It's awesome how you can still recognize some of the original, but then it became really, really big. It, it's just, it floors me how, uh, uh, how a beautiful mind like yours and Rob and everybody else that's involved in this can take something that simple that has these elements. And it's interesting, even I am now trying to think of some of these tunes I like so much and then blow them up to something like, like beyond imagination almost, and just get you know swept up by the music. It is really, it's, it's amazing what music can do, and it's amazing how you guys have been working on, on getting to this part. It's just, it's brilliant. Well, I don't know how Rob does it, but what I find is, um, I imagine myself sitting in a concert hall, actually listening to it, and then write down what they're playing. <laughs> So, kind of cheating, really. <laughs> and and yeah. just for clarity, eh, you you have no official musical background. It's not you went. It, this is this is something you. It's mostly homebrew. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Rob does. Rob is a, a yeah, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I have no musical qualifications whatsoever. It was just I I I, I taught myself all of this stuff by just listening and doing. It's just it's amazing. What would you do? What would you do different if you wind back time? Would you have taken a different career path? I think you, I read somewhere that you're a, a, a programmer these days. Sir. Is is that correct? You're a professional um, coder, eh? Well, I am when there's work. I've spent most of the time over the last three months packing up, um, packing up the CD box sets and stuff to go to people who have paid for Kickstarters. <laughs> you're a warehouse um, worker. Oh God, it was grueling um because uh, I, I delivered five kickstarters at once so people got this huge big box like david did got a huge big box. it's like early christmas present right there was a I lot know. of stuff in that box this guy uh, over delivers yeah. a, a, a signed c64 mini as well that we took all the way to prague um to get signed and the, the the customs people were very interested in what those things actually were when i was bringing them back there was like what's that 
and they were sort of sniffing it for drugs and stuff. <laughs> so, no, no, it's a mini, mini 8-bit computer with signatures on it. It's fine. And he was like, ha, ha, ha. So since we're on the topic of Kickstarters, uh, we're pre-recording this on a Thursday. World of Commodore is Saturday. When you're all watching this uh, Sunday, you have a Kickstarter that's wrapping up. What time on Sunday? Sometime on Sunday. Uh, 10 GMT. 10 GMT. Uh, Which what is, is uh, two o'clock uh, Pacific time, I think. So what are you trying to accomplish? How can people help? Um, we have, we, we have previously recorded 20 tunes in Prague with the, with the 80 piece Czech symphony orchestra who are world-class oh, goosebumps. Um, and we want to do another 20. We've, we, we're not finished, but we did. I, I, there were 40 came out of the, the, the main project when I started, some of them dropped by the wayside because Rob didn't want them in the project. But, um, We've got another 20, we want to go there and record them. So we've got both halves of the project finished. Stuff like Defender of the Crown and uh, Nemesis the Warlock, Master of Magic, Where the Exploding Fist 2, Wizardry. Uh, not that wizardry, the, the wizardry by The Edge, TM. Um, and people can help by going and buying, uh, pledging for a CD, Blu-ray, digital download, and there's, it uses Kickstarter's new add-on system, so you can add on lots of the other Kickstarters while you're at it. Um, there's a shift with your pledge later on to save postage. Um, we're not quite funded yet. Um, the more we can fund, the more we can do, because we need to... The, with, with the Blu-ray we did it for this one, which you can see samples of on the actual Kickstarter, there's a half an hour showreel. Um, we had one guy with a camera and we managed to create a really good Blu-ray out of that because the guy is very talented, but with more money, we would have more, we'd have something on the, the web brass and winds and something on the percussions. So, uh, we wouldn't need to, uh, continually reuse takes that weren't recorded with that audio. That was cheating slightly. Yeah. But yeah, CDs, Blu-rays, and people can even hire me to do an orchestration. I, I think I think that's the big thing. Uh, everybody should, if you haven't checked out the Kickstarter yet, go and check it out. It's constantly updated. The show reel that you've put up is just, it is absolutely awesome. If you didn't back the first one, this is your chance to back up the second one. New things have been added to this. It is just awesome. If you already have backed it, go back, check it again, pledge a little bit more. Uh, you're so close to getting this done. Now, this is going to be something that we'll talk about 100 years from now because it does preserve something that came from very little to something really, really big. And, and this is music that truly deserves an audience that's much broader than just those people that remember these tunes and just, you know, a professional treatment that it's been getting. It's just it's mind boggling. It is absolutely it's so worth backing. And because no one in the project actually was paid commercial rates, it was basically everyone was pretty much free. The Blu-ray cost three hundred pounds. <laughs> it's like a surround sound Blu-ray, two hours, and the three hundred pounds was how much it cost because the guy just had hotel and travel money to come and do it because he's such a fan. Right. And um, Rob's such a fan. He's doing this for. You know, it, it's all it's it's all a passion project, and it, which is lucky because it couldn't survive if anyone turned around and said, "I'm going to charge you fifty quid an hour." Well, Chris, not only not only that, you you brought up something really interesting on the remark you made with Rob, where he heard his own tunes and he's not afraid to completely depart from them as well, much further than even a remixer would dare to do. It is you can feel the love in the music. You know, I'm not a musical person, but I can get swept up in the music, mm -hmm. especially in classical music. That's what you can hear. It is the passion for the end product that's being created there. That is, that's what makes it so magical. And that's why it's so worthy of backing. I think so. It's a lot, a lot of, a lot of classical albums are done on a, on a, on a time budget and for a reason. Um, and they're even like um, uh, the, the composer, Commodore 64 composer Chris Hulsbeck was way ahead of us on a lot of this. 
mm -hmm. because he was having a symphonic concerts of his own stuff in 20 in a decade ago in germany because he happened one of the guys who was doing orchestral concerts happened to be a huge fan right but still some of the uh, the, the arrangements were very good and they were very professional but they were very professional if you yeah. see what i mean yeah yeah uh, they they were they were done to spec they had to be done in a short period of time um and some of it was um, almost too clever, mm -hmm. but it's it, it's brilliant stuff. But uh, the the stuff we're doing here has had years put into it, years of thought, or not all of it. Some of it just comes out in a week. But I've probably been thinking about it for six years. <laughs> now, I can't I can't figure out if you uh, if if you just create your own luck or if you think like seven steps ahead on the SID chessboard, I mean, you either have a master plan, but you definitely have momentum. I, I know that uh, COVID-19 has probably eroded some of that momentum like it has for, we, I've, I've been aware of lots of Kickstarters who have been hitting delays yes. or, or funding participation because of that. But um, yeah. You, we, uh, we finished the mixing for the first volume the weekend before the lockdown started. <laughs> And we were in we were in Prague not too long before the walls started to come down. So we just really looked out there. Yeah. Now we're, we're in the Kickstarter. We're hoping to go back in May, and um, even the people who can't go to the recording, they'll get a, a an HD live stream of the recording, which they can watch on YouTube as it's going, with audio right from the mixing desk, and uh, that's a. Um, that's a, an upper level pledge thing or you can add it on. Um, but it's it's amazing watching it say over a period of three days, you get like a about six concerts. It, um, through six days, six, uh, sorry, three days, six sessions. Each session is four hours. So that's an insane amount of, uh, of stuff. It's true dedication. It's true dedication of something that you've been working on uh, with a, a large number of other people that have shown interest and passion in this for, for many, many years. And that's, it's been built upon that basis. And it's, it's just, it's truly remarkable. And when David came back from the first recording, he was like, <laughs> he was over the moon, like truly over the moon, an experience that who would have thought, let's be clear, you know, all of us that are going to be watching this are, are about the same age grew up with the machine that brought us often the um, the career that we're in or that we have finished and 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 here we are we've got people that that are still building upon that it's just it's fantastic it really is nice and we're all now in a position where hopefully you know back in the day we had we had money to maybe buy that magazine and that was about it. Maybe one or two games once they become on sale, but that was about it. We've got a little bit more spending power now. We should be able to back projects that think larger than we could even imagine back in the day. You know, this is this is truly worthy. I, I really do think that, you know, this is this is something that really brings it to where it should have been. We couldn't have imagined mm -hmm. a world like this back in the day. Oh, Here on Thursday, David. there's there's a little bit more of a push necessary on this Kickstarter, and I've uh, been watching, biting the nails, hoping that uh, this will help get the word out and uh, push you over that that finish line. The last one was a nail biter as well. Yeah, I wish people would stop doing that. <laughs> 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 oh, it's um, there, there's a couple of whales that have been good to us. Yes. Um, well, you are but, definitely uh, giving our 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 memories the the amazing treatment that um, you have decided it deserves, and it has become so. So, thank you very much for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, okay. Any final kinds of sentiment you want to send out there to the internet? Why we got you here, or did we pretty much cover what you want to say? I don't. Well, I, we're supposed to make these I, things like thirty minutes. I'm pretty sure we've gone over time. I've never been watching the clock. Maybe we'll have to cut some of this out. But we'll okay, we'll be okay. Yeah. Well, the the Kickstarter, um, the Kickstarter page, I think has enough on it so that if you go there and you like what's on the page, you will love what's on the CD. 
if you go there and you don't understand quite what's going on, you can listen to the Tom Baker video, Tom Faker, sorry, and uh, have a laugh and then leave. But share it if you do, because someone else, one of your friends might like the John Williams uh, big romantic 80s sound that we could, we're going for. Because a lot of it comes from the, the love of 80s film soundtracks as well. We all got swept up in Rangers of the Lost Ark, Star Wars, E.T., Back to the Future, all that stuff. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and we'll be seeing you in the QA section, the Discord channel. And uh, thanks for your time. Chris, thanks so much. Take care. Well, thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye for now.